Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Time for our monthly Q&A session. I have received some very good questions this time, and I hope you will find my answers worthwhile. However, some questions deserve a much longer answer, so I will skip them from today's video and make dedicated videos for them in the future. Questions answered in today's video include, first, Mega Daryl, Dan Tian practice. Second, author Sento, meditation practice without a teacher. Third, author Sento's characters used to write Qigong. Fourth, Ai Lin, Hun Yuan Jian Jing. Fifth, nominal Taoist and TCM explanation of reactivation. Sixth, nominal. Row of Magu, Seventh, Shivan, Fasting, Eighth, from Jeroen KV, Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang, Ninth, Bruno Nguyen's History of Feng Yan Quan, Ten, Bruno Nguyen's Xing Yi Quan Pu, Eleventh, Frederick Gaudin, Sword Routine Beginning Movement, Twelfth, Core X, Usage of uh, Xing versus Shen. 13th from ID 98, Xing Yi Fundamentals Training. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Megadaro asked a question about his practice. Let me read his uh, questions first. Quote, I have been filling up my Dantian and here are some symptoms I have been getting. First, sometimes a contracting and expanding mechanism at my Dantian. Feels like a morphing small. Second, sometimes my whole abdomen becomes intensely hot and contracts on itself. Feel like I want to stop breathing. Three, pressure at my forehead. How close would you say I'm to feeling the Dantian? Are any of these symptoms a concern? Mega Daryl, thank you for your questions. Let me answer them one by one. To your first question about feeling the Dantian, well, bear in mind, Dantian is not a physical container and there's no way to feel it. In Xiu Dao practice, we use the term Dan Tian to indicate an area of focus. The objective of focusing on the Dan Tian is to awaken internal energy, which is stored everywhere in the body, not just the lower Dan Tian area. It is a very common misunderstanding with regards to the Dan Tian. So, since there is no much practice of feeling the Dantian, then there's no way to feel the Dantian. I recommend you check out my video Introduce Dantian, link is in the description. As for your second question about your experienced sensations, well, some of them are good and some of them should be avoided if possible. For example, pressure at your forehead is a good sign. However, others are not. I suspect you focus too much on your body. In other words, your mental concentration is a little too intense. You should relax your mind. If you think your mind is relaxed, Try to relax even further until you reach a point where you are only passively aware of the existence of your body. Intense mental concentration in such instance will actually hinder your practice. Mega Daryl, I hope that answers the question. Let's move on to the next one. After Santos asked about the potential harm of practicing meditation without the guidance of a specialized teacher. Author, first of all, 
Thank you for your kind words about my videos. I'm very happy to see that my videos provide value to you. And uh, as I have mentioned in prior videos, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. It's my pleasure and honor to share my knowledge for the benefit of the entire community. Now let's get to your question about the potential harm of practicing meditation without a teacher. Well, it depends. Since you use the specific word meditation in your question, speaking from decades of shoot out practice and teaching experience, I have to say that I have witnessed many people who did not practice meditation correctly which caused them unnecessary psychological and other issues. Usually, people keep their negative practice experience confidential. However, I know it's because they asked me for help with their practice and related issues. Bottom line, meditation is overall very safe. Unless you force yourself too much during practice, such as concentrating too much during practice, or overwhelming yourself by trying many styles at the same time. My advice to the community is to follow the Tao's principle of treating everything in practice naturally without forcing anything, including your focus. This is the key aspect of practice. Arthur, I hope that answers your question about practice. Now, let's look at your second question. Arthur Santo also asked me about the character used for Qigong which he found in a book. First of all, I have no idea about that book and the author, but to give you a quick answer, he did use the correct character. Now, let me answer your question in more detail since it is both a Qigong and a Xiu Dao related topic. The character Qi is the traditionally correct character, while Qi has become acceptable in modern times. Both of them are pronounced exactly the same. However, they are totally different in meaning. The first character Qi consists of two parts. The upper part is pronounced Wu, which means void or emptiness, while the lower part is pronounced Huo, which means fire. Put together, this character means to use fire to burn emptiness. In Xiu Dao, emptiness reflects the nature of Dao or where we should focus in practice. Well, fire implies the mind. So, this character tells us that Qi is the practice that uses the mind to focus on emptiness. The second word Qi just means energy or air or breath. So, in modern times, the second character is commonly used for Qigong, but the first character has traditionally always been used in Xiu Dao practice and is the only correct one. Of course, when you read Xiu Dao documents published in the last 100 years, you will find the second character Qi occurring commonly which is actually incorrect. This is the major reason why many people misunderstand the core practice of Xiu Dao. By the way, I have a prior video titled Xiu Dao, Dao's Meditation and Beyond, in which I have introduced very important concepts and terms including Qi. Link is in the description. So, he used the right character in that book. I hope that answers your question. Arthur, let's move on to the next one. Arlene asked me a question about Hun Yuan Jian Jing. He asked if Hun Yuan Jian Jing is ex exclusively a standard alone system or if it is possible 
to apply its principles to combine Xiu Dao with a general sword practice such as the Tai Chi sword. Or it is the common occurrence where Xiu Dao and the sword practice are combined aside from this test. Alin is a student of mine living in New York. He has visited and practiced with me in Montreal many times in the last few years. Alin, thank you for the question as well as giving me the opportunity to talk about Hun Yuan Jian Jing. Let me briefly introduce this wonderful document first, since I believe most of our community members have never even heard the name. Hun Yuan Jian Jing is the most important Jian Xian or Sword Immortal Practice document. It is very profound in terms of concept, theory, practice, and application. And this is the hand copied version of the book given to me by my grandfather. The Hun Yuan Jian Jing consists of uh, two volumes. The first volume talks about Xiu Dao practice with a sword, and uh, the second volume introduces martial application of a sword and uh, talks further about the Xiu Dao practice with the sword. So, this important book is mainly used for Xiu Dao practice, but it can be used to some extent for martial sword practice as well. So, to answer your question, it is a standalone system but can be used as an enhancement to other sword practice such as Tai Chi sword. However, adding Hun Yuan Jian Jing to martial sword is a byproduct. I may introduce this style in the future if time permits. Adin, I hope that answers your question. Let's look at the next question. Nomino asks if there is the Taoist TCM explanation for the reactivation or sprouting of a dry seed in the presence of water. Nomino, thank you for the question. Taoists believe that seeds contain yang energy from the universe, while water contains yin energy, which awakens the yang energy reserved in seeds. This is the old Taoist concept and may not sound scientific, but it makes sense in the Taoist context. Hope that answers the question. Nominal, let's look at your second question. <clears throat> Nominal asks about the role of Magu, the immortal Taoist deity that refers to hemp, cannabis. Thank you for this question as well. Nominal. This question is related to religious Taoism. Although I don't practice religious Taoism myself, I am well aware of the culture, linguistic, and contextual background surrounding Magu, so I am in the position to answer your question. Magu, one of the legendary figures in religious Taoism, has never been associated with hemp, cannabis, or any such substance. Her name represents longevity. There are quite a few reasons why people called her Ma Gu or Aunt Ma or Girl Ma. Ma can be a family name or means fibers like hemp, flax, and so on. For example, her father was a Ma Chiu, and the daughter of Ma Chiu is Ma Gu. According to another legendary story, there she had pork marks on her face, which are also called Ma in Chinese. Her name has nothing to do with hemp or cannabis. Now, there is a chemical drug called Ma Gu, Ma Gu which uses the same character as Ma Gu. The Dao is the female immortal. But the legendary figure Ma Gu has nothing to do with the substance Ma Gu. By the way, 
My family name is Yang, which means aspen tree. But we have nothing to do with aspen trees. Well, I did practice Jiugong around aspen tree as part of my Bagua practice, so there is definitely that connection. Links to my Jiugong video is in the description. If you ask me, I think whoever first associated Magu with cannabis were probably under the influence of cannabis themselves and were just being creative. There are many other misunderstandings about the Chinese names and the terms, and I will clarify them as and when I get the chance. I hope that answers the question. Nominal, let's move on to the next one. Shi Wan asked about my opinion on fasting and the Tao's writings related to it. Thank you, Shi Wan. This is a great question. I used to practice the Bi Gu when I was a university student. I practiced it twice a year for about four years and then stopped after university. In Taoism, there are hundreds of recipes for this type of practice. Traditionally, Bi Gu should be combined with Xiu Dao or Qi Gong practice in order to get full benefits. In Taoism, there are different types of Bi Gu which include both partial and total fasting. I will talk at length about the Bi Gu in a future video, but I hope this suffice for now. Shivan, let's move on to the next question. Jerome KV asks about combination style like Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang. He also asks about Sha Guo Zheng's practice since there is the Ba Gua circle walking with Xing Yi hands and the structure. He asks how and why these combinations were developed. Um, Jerome, thank you for your question. Yes, Zhang Zhao Dong, one of the best Xing Yi and Ba Gua masters in history, Developed Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang, a style that integrates these two styles. He developed it in Tianjin. My grandfather Yang Qinlin was his student. I learned Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang from my grandfather and I know it very well. Actually, Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang is not a style that uses circle walking while holding Xing Yi posters. It uses Xing Yi movement to apply Ba Gua walking and body methods. As a result, the power generation and the release is unique to the style. An integration of the flexible force of Ba Gua and the strong Fa Jin of Xing Yi. Again, body method or Shen Fa is aimed at developing Fa Jin or power release. So, a style should be judged on the basics of its martial power and body method, not by its postures. Now, let's talk about Sha Guo Zheng. Sha Guo Zheng was a great martial art practitioner. He practiced Xing Yi and Ba Gua in Tianjin. Actually, the style that Sha Guo Zheng practiced was Xing Yi Ba Gua Palm restructured by Jiang Rongqiao. A student of Zhang Zhao Dong. Sha Guo Zheng learned from many teachers, including Jiang Rongqiao. So, Sha Guo Zheng's practice represented Jiang Rongqiao's Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang. Now, let's talk about why Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang was developed. Short answer Zhang Zhao Dong. Let me elaborate. Zhang Zhao Dong learned Xing Yi and Ba Gua from two great masters. He learned Xing Yi from Liu Qilan, one of the eight disciples of Li Luoneng, the founder of Xing Yi. He learned Ba Gua from Dong Haichuan, the most important Ba Gua disseminator of his time. To be precise, Zhang Zhao Dong, although considered a disciple of Dong Haichuan, mainly learned Ba Gua from Dong Haichuan's disciple, Cheng Tinghua. That is why Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang maintained the flexible aspect of Cheng style Ba Gua while integrating power release from his Xing Yi practice. 
Please check out my video on Zhang Zhaodong and the Xing Yi Bagua Palm. Link is in the description. Um, Jerome KV, I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. <coughs> Bruno Nguyens asked two questions. Let's get to them one by one. His first question is about the history of uh, Phoenix Eye Feast or Feng Yan Quan. Well, Feng Yan Quan is just a hand shape. Any style can use this feast shape. However, a legendary story says that it was developed by an unknown woman in the Qing Dynasty. According to the same story, Hong Xiguan, the founder of Hong Quan, was killed by a girl who used this Feng Yan Quan. In my opinion, it is just a common fit shape and is commonly found in many styles. Also, I do not believe this legendary story at all. In Bruno's second question, he asked which Xing Yi Quan Pu or Xing Yi Training Manual is the most important. Well, before I answer this question, allow me to brag about my document collection. If a traditional and noteworthy Xing Yi document exists, I have a copy of it. In my opinion, the Quan Pu written by Guo Yunshen, Li Sunyi, and Xue Dian are the best. However, since they wrote them in traditional Chinese, which is not only hard for most people to translate to English, but is also largely incomprehensible to most modern Chinese readers. Any Quan Pu should be interpreted by an expert, or else they will not make any sense. Even worse, they will very likely get misinterpreted, which you may have noticed a lot in recent times. Unfortunately, but true. Bruno, I hope that answers both of your questions. Let's move on to the next question. Frederick Gaudin asks four questions of which I will answer only the first one today. Well, the rest will be answered in specific videos in the future. His first question is, in the opening form of the sword routine, there is a movement that looks like a salute. What is the origin of this movement? By the way, Frederick Gaudin studied Xing Yi with me before and I taught him many different types of Xing Yi weapons. Fred, thank you for your questions and my apologies. I cannot answer them all today. Yes, the sword routines do have a beginning movement as you mentioned. Actually, this is a preparatory form that consists of a short series of movements which only have about a hundred years worth of history in Xing Yi practice. In the old days, practitioners would first hold the sword in their right hand and then just begin their routine. Let's have a quick look at this video. Later, about 100 years ago, in order to demonstrate the weapon in public, practitioners started holding a sword first in their left hand and transfer it to the right hand during the preparatory form. If you see most modern sword demonstrations, almost all of them follow this approach. I teach both ways. Fred, I hope I have answered your first question. I will answer the rest in future videos. So, thank you in advance for your patience. Let's move on to the next one. Carl S. asks why the term Xing is used to describe the body as opposite to the more common term Shen. Thank you, Carl S. This is a great question. I'm impressed by your detailed observation. 
the character 的形 and 身 are very similar and very often interchangeable in common parlance. However, in martial art practice, they have a different meanings. Xing is a proper word used in martial arts because Xing can mean shape or structure in addition to the common meaning body. Xing is used to describe a dynamic state of the body. Now, Shen also means body, but it refers to a more static nature of the body. So, in the martial sense, Shen and Xing are rather opposite qualities related to the body. In other words, Shen is the more of the static physical aspect of the body, while Xing emphasizes the dynamic nature resulting from body movements. Correct. I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the final question for today. ID98 asks about Xing Yi fundamental training. If someone has time constraints. Thank you, ID98. I'm sure many people in the community also are faced with the same question, so I'm sure this answer would benefit many in the community. Well, if you do not have enough time to practice the entire content of Xing Yi, I recommend you focus on the core or fundamental content. I divide fundamental Xing Yi practice into two content categories. First category consists of a single exercise for developing Fa Jin since Xing Yi is a Fa Jin based style. The second category consists of the five elements. Any Xing Yi practitioner has to practice the five elements exercise, no exceptions. Regarding other content like 12 animals and routines, it depends on your time. But the core contents always takes the priority. You will find a lot of Xing Yi single exercises in the demonstration section of my lecture videos. Link to my lecture playlist is in the description. With that, we conclude this month's Q&A. I hope my answers will improve your understanding and benefit your practice. Thank you for watching. See you next time and. Enjoy your practice.